So, unser nächster Sprecher ist der ähm, Joam Evans Pim aus Galicien. Galicien ist auch eine Region, die von Spanien besetzt ist. Er arbeitet für die NGO äh, Center for Global Lawn Killing und ist äh, Mitglied des wissenschaftlichen Beirats des Transnational Institute of Social Ecology. Wir haben jetzt hier schon äh, viel gehört, Abdullah Öcalans Thesen wurden verglichen mit denen von Foucault, von Gramsci, von Maria Mies und äh, Bam macht jetzt recht aus eine vergleichende Analyse zwischen den Ideen von Mahatma Gandhi, der sich ebenfalls für, Auto, für autarke äh, Dorfrepubliken eingesetzt hat, für die Vision eines einer gewaltfreien Gesellschaft. Ähm, wir kommen jetzt wieder auf Indien zurück. Die, äh, Dr. Rada Sousa hat ja schon äh, über Indien gesprochen. Leider hatte sie auch so wenig Zeit. Sie hat mir äh, später gesagt, dass in Indien tatsächlich ein Drittel des gesamten Staatsgebietes äh, schon von maoistischen äh, Gruppen inzwischen äh, kontrolliert wird. Und äh, dass über 40 Prozent der Guerillakämpferinnen äh, dort auch Frauen sind, also wie in Kurdistan. Und äh, wir äh, richten jetzt noch mal unseren Blick auf Indien. Hallo? 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 Greetings. Os melhores cumprimentos também do povo da Galícia ao povo da Kurdistão. It's, um, it's been really humbling and inspiring to be here for these, um, for these three days, uh, learning a lot and uh, about uh, a movement and a vision that has also been of great inspiration for in my own homeland as we try to rethink our future. Um, and I would really like to thank everybody who's been involved in, in the organization and making this, this event possible. Um, before I get into the main topic, I wanted to make a, a few observations on some of the things we've been saying. I think it's a good introduction. Uh, for several, in several occasions, we mentioned this 5,000 years benchmark. Um, I think it's an important question and it also opens a very interesting uh, historical irony. Uh, 5,000 years ago a very strange thing happened in Mesopotamia for the first time in the history of our species. Uh, it only happened twice again in, um, in later times in Mesoamerica and in the far uh, in, 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 in Asia and this is um, the, the creation of a creature which has subsequently been called the state and that is characterized by extreme levels of stratification, inequality, uh, the emergence of social hierarchy, uh, patriarchy, accumulation of goods, um, the creation of professional military organizations, um, the rise of systemic violence and warfare, and um, the emergence of large cities. This is something that has never happened before in the history of our species. Um, the previous landscape um, for the, for the uh, at least 100,000 years before that was characterized by uh, a forms of social organizations that were essentially egalitarian, uh, based on cooperation, an economy based on sharing, uh, and uh, in political terms, it, these were acephalous and autonomous units. Uh, I think uh, Ocalan very wisely presented the emergence of this uh, creature that was born in Mesopotamia as an anomaly or a disease in terms of our human experience. And I think the irony of what we've been discussing for the last day, re days resides that it's precisely in Mesopotamia, 5,000 years later, that uh, a treatment uh, that calls for the sanity of humanity and to uh, dissect, as we have mentioned in the title, and, and treat this um, pathological disease which is called the state, and especially in its latest form, which is uh, uh, capitalism, 
uh, I think it's, 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 it's an irony that the Serbs are our attention. Uh, the other aspect that we mentioned, several people mentioned, is the 99%, or it could be 95, but we, we won't get into the maths for that. Uh, so, if we consider that the state is a, is a creature of the last uh, 5,000 years in Mesopotamia, much later in other parts of the world, such as where we are uh, physically today, um, we have to understand that for 99% of our history of our species, we've actually lived in a form of in uh, social organizations that are uh, characterized by the ethos of egalitarianism, sharing, cooperation, which I think is also in the core of, uh, of what democratic confederalism represents and is trying to, to bring uh, our, uh, the, the, the natural form of organization that has characterized our, our species. Um, in, in the opening words that Ocala, Ocalan uh, mentioned uh, is also that um, this pathological development which is called the state and, and its form in its capitalist form is also pushing us towards, uh, I quoted, uh, limits of sustainability. Um, I think it would be fair to say that it's actually pushing us into the verge of extinction. And, and please let me emphasize this last aspect. As uh, we've been three days here, and I, I haven't, we, we talked a bit of energy, of sustainability, of ecology. Uh, the word peak oil has not come up once, and I think it also deserves uh, rather serious attention because. Oil is basically the blood of capitalism, and if we're trying to replace capitalism, capitalism with uh, some form of alternative, we should uh, consider uh, the, the basic energy that has, that has sustained it and its uh, monstrous growth over the past century. Um, also in Ocalan's greeting, he uh, established a contrast between what he called the freedom paradigm and the war paradigm. Um, and I think over the past days we've also seen some of the aspects of what um, the therapy of democratic confederalism uh, as a form of, um, uh, as a therapy for this, this disease, how, how some of its components have, are, 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 have been suggested. From the cooperative in, in Rojava we heard, our legacy will be our culture of sharing. I think that was a very important statement. Um, we also heard that before the state there was ethics, there was moral society. And I think Havin mentioned that uh, moral society was the uh, natural state of society prior uh, to the state. So how can we um, understand democratic confederalism and democratic modernity as, a, as an antidote for this slow epidemic that has been taking over the whole planet for the last uh, 5,000 years. Uh, having said this, uh, the, the actual focus of this paper will be to, to contrast or, or bring some insights comparing the liberation movement that for 30 years occurred in India um, under, mainly under the leadership of Mohammed Gandhi with, with the Kurdish movement. I think several reasons call, uh, make this comparison appropriate. Uh, first of all, uh, eventually, perhaps a bit early in the case of India, uh, Gandhi and Ocalan rejected the nation state as a solution for the liberation struggle. In the second case, I think both uh, movements have a uh, eventually developed a, crit a very critical approach towards uh, the use of, of violence and what violence means in, in the societies we're trying to, to construct for the future. Interestingly, also both leaders were ostracized by international community because of being labeled as freedom fighters, terrorists. These two words were actually used to turn down uh, five Nobel Peace nominations of, of Gandhi and they're still used today to keep uh, the Kurdish movement in, in the international terrorist lists. And I think the, uh, the finally the, one of the most interesting things is in terms of results. What happened in India after that 40 years of, of struggle. So we're going to go into that hopefully fast enough for, for you to have lunch and enjoy it also soon. Um, so we actually gone into this, but I, I just wanted to mention that um, democratic uh, confederalism is, is, is uh, presented by Ocalan as a non-state uh, non social paradigm 
a democratic system of a people without a state. Ocalan mentions uh, the state does not increase the freedom of a people. States are funded on power, but democracies are based on collective consensus. The state uses coercion as a legitimate means. Democracies rest on voluntary participation. Uh, many years previous uh, to that, uh, Gandhi said, the state represents violence in a concentrated and organized form. The individual has a soul, yeah, I'll go slow now. But as the state is a soulless machine, it can never be weaned from violence to which it owns its very existence. Uh, very early on, uh, Gandhi followed um, the writings of Thoreau, uh, especially his books on civil disobedience and also Walden, uh, and in which uh, politics was actually uh, understood as self-governance was actually presented as a, as a deeply political everyday, everyday life experience. This also resonated with something uh, Ani Abdullah mentioned, which is politics is the business of society. That's why uh, presented uh, against the challenge of the state as a solution to uh, the liberation struggle, uh, Gandhi argued that it would be uh, the, the ideal form of uh, a free, non-violent society in India would be an ordered anarchy. Uh, and he also added, a centralization as a system is inconsistent with such a form of non-violent society. Okay. Um, I think as another point in which um, both uh, leaders converge is that uh, Gandhi insisted that um, by replicating the educational, political, economic, legal, military frameworks of the state that was oppressing, that was uh, taking away the liberty of, of or the, the possibility of freedom of India would be the major obstacle uh, for independence to be achieved. And we'll go into the concept of, of independence in Gandhian thinking. So independence would actually not be would not mean taking control of those administra administrative structures, but rather it should, uh, it should mean the, the removal of these structures altogether. Um, Ocalan mentioned, uh, uh, it's in some of his works, that the state is actually an obstacle for the social development of any people. And uh, we cannot liberate ourselves if we a try or we continue to attempt to use the tools that serve uh, our own oppression. Uh, just before Gandhi died, um, um, and of course uh, the, the results that uh, the Sosa can mention, uh, mention uh, briefly is that uh, of course independence did not lead, formal independence of India did not lead to the kind of society the movement had been envisioning, applying also in, pr in, in practice for all these decades, but rather something very different. And this is something Gandhi realized also before, before he died. In his last will and testament, he uh, expressed that India, having attained political independence through means devised by the Indian National Congress, this is as a propaganda vehicle of the parliamentary machine has outlived its use. India has still to attain social, moral and economic independence in terms of its 700,000 villages. Yep, three minutes, okay. That's all. Uh, so basically, uh, Gandhi argued that there were two schools of thought that were moving the world in opposing directions. One is the, that of the cities, which are dependent on machinery, industrialization, and war, and the other one would be that of the rural village, based on handicrafts and embeddedness in nature. This, I think, return us, it returns us to that idea of the Ocalan mentioned in the opening speech of the difference between the war paradigm and the freedom paradigm. Gandhi expressed that um, modern cities uh, drain the lifeblood of the villages. And of course, we have already mentioned peak oil and how uh, that is, is also the, the, the blood of, of capitalist modernity. Um, 
I won't go into that, but it's also interesting how uh, the Gandhian movement was also a precursor of many of the contemporary ideas on organic agriculture, bio biodynamics, and so forth. And just to mention something uh, the Sosa said is that in this industrialism is um, incompatible with, with democracy. And, and the consequences of this were actually seen in India after independence uh, in a book that Shiva wrote, The Violence of Green Revolutions, which I think is very similar to what happened in South Africa, uh, when, when the consequences of the neoliberal quick fix promises for development were actually implemented with extremely tragical results. So what is the alternative uh, that, uh, what is the, the alternative that uh, the Gandhian movement proposed in India? This alternative was based in three pillars. The first is Swaraj, which means integral community, non-hierarchical self-government. Uh, Swadeshi means self-sufficiency. And the last uh, concept is Satyagraha, which means uh, truth power or truth force, which I think is also would deserve a, a closer analysis it compared to Ochalan's uh, truth regimes, but we won't go into that. Uh, so Swaraj, understood as self-government, is a continuous effort to be independent of government control, whether it's foreign, foreign government or national. I think the importance of this is that um, and I think the next slide illustrates that. Uh, the idea of independence is not something that must be uh, achieved in, 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 in terms of gaining the control of, a, of a administrative apparatus of a state, but it's actually something that should begin at the bottom. In, uh, in, the, in, in the way Gandhi presented this is that every single village in India should become a, a village Swaraj or a village republic with full powers. Uh, to the extent that it should be able to manage its affairs uh, and to the extent of defending itself against the whole world. So I think this also is very close to the idea of embedded council democracy which is proposed by democratic confederalism in Kurdistan. Um, another important aspect is that uh, Gandhi emphasized that there is no need to wait for any major revolution or uh, you know, in, in, in the Marxist tradition of taking the power, control of the state power, but is, this is something that any community, any person in any community can start doing uh, now and any, at any point without waiting for anything to happen on the outside. This is a, a work of a lifetime and it's a work that the community can, can be involved in terms of uh, gaining its independence based on these three pillars of self-government, self-sufficiency and, and truth force. Finally, and this is just to finish, I, I wanted to bring another concept which I think is, is interesting to compare uh, in the Gandhian thinking and, and, and uh, Ocalan's democratic confederalism. Uh, in, in India, uh, Gandhi's thought was very much focused on the specifics of the village republic, and I think that is also something we can still learn from as it was a basis for some movements that appeared later on as the eco-villages movement, more recently transition towns initiatives uh, based on the intentional communities, the ashrams and so forth. But uh, what, was, what wasn't presented at all clearly was how these villages should uh, relate to each other in the context of a stateless society. And I think this is something that Ocalan's vision of democratic confederalism actually presents in a much more clear way. Uh, the only uh, writings that Gandhi uh, now um, how village republics should relate is, is the concept of oceanic circles that he presented as a global federation of small, self-sufficient but interdependent village republics. Uh, and I think that uh, for, for those of us who are working to try to uh, adapt and rethink this vision for each of our own places of origin, uh, democratic confederalism represents a tangible way in which uh, uh, society, small scale societies can relate to each other. And I guess I don't have much more time, but I'll be happy to, to discuss some of these ideas with you in, in more detail in the debate. So thank you so much. Ja, vielen Dank, Joam.
das war sehr interessant und vor allen Dingen äh, zeigt es natürlich, dass man in vielen Teilen der Welt zu ähnlichen Ergebnissen kommt. Äh, 